I am thrilled to have Isaac here. Um, Isaac is the director of the SALT Institute for Documentary Studies. We, I reached out to Isaac to ask if he'd be willing to present a program for us. Um, and the title of his talk, Folk History, Community Narratives, and Storytelling. Oops, I'm going to have to go back. Um, so I have a short bio I'll share with you. Um, Isaac, I was very impressed to learn more about Isaac's um, experiences. He's an audio producer, journalist, found, co-founder and production of the com, um, sorry, co-founder of the production company Future Projects. He's been a newspaper reporter, a farmer, a stern man on a commercial lobster boat. Comes from Portland with his wife and two young boys. So Isaac, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I will switch over the PowerPoint and have you up. So thank you, Isaac. So, just to clarify, I, I am from Portland, Maine. I do come from Portland, Maine, uh, with a wife and two children, but the children are not here. <laughs> Luckily for all of us, um, especially. Oh, stop. <laughs> um, so, uh, is this okay? Can everyone hear me? Is this good? Yeah. All right. Um, so, I'm just curious who, I know some people have not heard of SALT. I overheard a little bit as I was sitting here. Who has heard of the SALT Institute for Documentary Studies? All right. Who has not heard of the SALT Institute? So many people. All right. Um, so uh, I guess um, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm just going to talk about sort of the history of what, what SALT is, hopefully make it uh, a little more familiar to all of you. I'm going to talk about kind of where we have come from and, and where, we, where we are now and I think um, where we're going. Uh, so to tell the story of SALT, um, we have to start in, in Georgia. And Raven Gap, Nacoochee County, Georgia, uh, which is in Appalachia. Uh, in 1967, there was a high school English teacher, and he noticed that like a lot of these stories in the community that his, his students lived in, his high school students lived in, were um, being lost. As this kind of older generation um, passed on, there was a lot of knowledge, a lot of folk knowledge that was um, you know, not being preserved. So he kind of sent his students out into the field to do oral history style interviews with, with elders in the community. And the result was this project called Foxfire. Um, has anyone heard of Foxfire? Okay, so Foxfire is kind of in the, in the DNA of, of what SALT is, as you'll see. So Foxfire, um, it becomes a magazine that is produced by these high school students. It's named for a glow-in-the-dark bioluminescent mushroom that, that grows in Appalachia. And um, the, um, the magazine is, is very detailed sort of uh, interviews with, um, with folks in the, in the region about um, kind of folk life, um, so traditions, like uh, this is one of a, um, like how to fell a, a tree with an ax. Um, this one's about notching and jointing. So these are very kind of, these, each, each magazine is filled with articles about these really um, really, really uh, detailed articles about kind of folk life and what's going on there. Um, here's one about making quilts. These are just, these are just images from the magazine from Foxfire. Um, and it, it, it becomes very, very popular. Um, so they're, they're compiled into a book um, called the Foxfire Book. And I think there's like nine of them at least. Foxfire still exists as well. Um, and Elliot Wigginton, the, the guy, he actually wins a MacArthur Fellowship and it kind of spawns similar programs in other schools it almost becomes like a franchise that like other schools adopt this so in addition to the foxfire book we have the lava lolly book which is like the texas version of the foxfire book and all of them seem to have this thing where i don't know if it was like required but they all kind of list a few things this one is the foxfire book hog dressing log cabin building mountain crafts and foods planting by the sign snake lore hunting tales faith healing moonshining and other affairs of plain living. And this one's 
The Lop Lolly book in Texas is water witching, wild hog hunting, home remedies, grandma's moral tares, tales, and other affairs of plain Texas living. So they all kind of list this. Um, this one doesn't. This is Bittersweet Country. It's in the Ozarks. It's another sort of very um, inspired by Fox Fire series. Um, apparently 37 high schools adopted this. So there's, there's other ones out there. And I'm sort of obsessed with them. I try to collect these books if I can find them. But they're very hard to search for. So if anyone knows of any, uh, <laughs> let me know. Um, it goes as far as Alaska. There's the Chimai book, um, which is kayaks, dog sleds, bear hunting, bush pilots, smoked fish, mukluks, and other traditions of southwestern Alaska. Um, and then you probably guess where this is going. There's the salt book. So salt <clears throat> also comes from this sort of, um, obviously from this foxfire history. So um, if you can't read it, it's lobstering, sea moss pudding, stone walls, rum running, maple syrup, snowshoes, and other Yankee doings. Um, so uh, there's a, a cover of the very first salt, um, salt magazine under a, under a pier. And it was started by um, a woman named uh, Pamela Wood. Um, and she was an English teacher right up the right up 95 from here in Kennebunk. Um, and um, I'll just read this to you. Um, so it says, uh, very simply, it's about the Yankee seacoast and the people who live here. Our stories are told by the sons and daughters of old time New Englanders, as well as the children of more recent settlers who have fled the cities to live on these proud and yielding shores. Why salt? Because salt is a natural symbol for the magazine, the salt of the sea, salt washed soil, salt marshes, and salty people. Um, so, you know, I think what's interesting about this is, um, you know, first that it's, it's driven by the sort of the curiosity of, of students, which I think is pretty amazing. But also, you know, I was thinking about um, capturing stories from a community. And I think one of the things that salt has done pretty elegantly over the years uh, is, is to evolve and think about what it means to how do you define the community that you're trying to capture the stories of? So one thing that I was struck by, the sort of the original mission statement of SALT, is that um, it's very specific. It's old, old time, sons and daughters of old time members, as well as most more recent settlers. So you know, there's no mention of any you know, indigenous people here or immigrants. Or, um, so I think at first they weren't thinking as broadly about their mission, but or our mission, I guess I should say. Um, Oh, so here's just uh, some examples from, from Salt Magazine. Uh, very similar to the Foxfire stuff. Very uh, practical. Um, how to knit a lobster trap head. And um, you, you all could knit a lobster trap head after you read this. Is that, that detail, I'm sure. Um, uh, here's another one about um, uh, a, clam, a, clam, clam bake, a clam raker, a clammer who no one has ever beaten. Um, um, there's the students from the very first ever uh, Salt Magazine. There they are again, so high school students. Um, so um, this is a, from later on, I'm just going to share you kind of how, the, how our, our mission of community storytelling has evolved. Um, so this is another um, sort of glimpse of Salt's mission. And here in the, um, I think this is from the early 80s, late 70s, um, it's pretty much the same mission statement, except it now includes, um, it says that in addition to the sons and daughters of, um, you know, old-time New Englanders, it's also uh, French-Canadian settlers and descendants of, of Native Indian tribes. So, you know, we're, we're starting to think more broadly about who, whose stories we consider part of, of the community. Um, it's just another nice, salt magazine cover for y'all. Um, I really love the, the design of these. Um, <coughs> So this is another um, you know, way that our, um, our, uh, our mission has evolved. Um, so it says, uh, the essence of the Cordley magazine consists of documented interviews with distinctive people whose roots run deep and whose memories span generations. Salt seeks to preserve the stories, record the skills, and explain ways of doing things known to a fast-vanishing fast generation. Um, so it's very much a sort of preservation-minded you know, uh, um mission to salt at this point. Um, and then, um, so salt kind of evolves, it, it splits off, we split off from the high school and kind of become an independent organization. So we offer instruction in writing and photography, but also um, for a few years, salt offers apprenticeships. Um, so you could also come to salt and learn uh, boat building, 
or uh, animal husbandry, or like um, uh, truck farming, uh, seamanship and fishing, and um, uh, general construction. So I think it's, it's very interesting that those become as important to Saul's mission um, as uh, documenting the community with uh, you know, writing and photography is. Um, so eventually salt you know, um, starts to think of itself as three things, which is a salt, which is a, what is salt? It's a magazine, an educational experience, and an archive of Maine folk life and culture. So really thinking about like what we mean, what we mean to the community. Um, and then um, I think this is really uh, important is um, Saul starts to sort of have this thing where we talk about documenting uh, the really important people of Maine. And I think that's like maybe a slightly imperfect way of putting it, but I think what we're, what we're saying is that um, there are certain um, you know, celebrities who maybe like absorb all the attention, and what Saul is trying to do is look at the people who, um, who, are, who are not that. You know, the, um, one of the tenets of, of uh, doing oral history is you start with people who have the least amount of power, because a lot of times those people have um, the most to say. So, you know, examples like you would interview the doorman to a building rather than the CEO to find out something. So I think Salt really um, tries to um, to do that. Um, so the slogan becomes, spend the semester with the really important people of Maine. Um, and in a world of big headlines and loud noises, Salt Magazine provides a quiet corner <laughs> for reflection, um, which I think is really... Um, a really great way to put it. Um, and then, um, this is just like a little thing that I think was um, uh, hanging around in the salt classroom at one point, and um, it says, uh, stand out in the field, it could be a pasture or a city walk, sniff out a story like Tony the Rock Hound sniffs out a quartz crystal, watch people in synagogues, diners, malls, and apple orchards, listen to a Cambodian refugee tell his first joke in English, Wrap with clam diggers and Muhammad from Afghanistan. Hold on to your pen or hold on to your camera. Use your sense. Um, so I think at this point, you know, this is in, it's probably in the 90s, SALT has really um, expanded its mission to really be inclusive of, of the whole community. I think that there's a real effort here to use inclusive language in what we are um, trying, to, trying, to, trying to document. Um, so you know, meanwhile, um, SALT is moving around a lot. So. Um, in 2000, Salt bought this really nice building in, uh, in downtown Portland. Um, if anyone's been to Portland, it's on Exchange, it's on Exchange Street, um, right across from the Portland Press Herald, which is now the Press Hotel, like right in the heart of downtown. And um, they, uh, Salt becomes what it is now, which is the Salt Institute for Documentary Studies. And uh, around the same time, they started offering classes in radio as well. So it's um, writing, photography, and radio. And students come for about 15 weeks. It's now, it's moved on from high school students to sort of postgraduate, which is what it is today. And you can come and take a class in um, writing, radio, or, or photography. You spend about 15 weeks in the state kind of immersing yourself uh, in your story. Um, so that, that's kind of what Salt evolves to in the year 2000. That's pretty much what we, uh, what we still do today. And um, oh, that's the building. Um, so, uh, and then um, around 2008, Salt moves uh, to another building here. This is the Conga Street building. And then um, in 2016, Salt merges with the main College of Art. Um, and you know, one of the main reasons that this happened was, uh, I'm sure as you all know, like keeping a small organization afloat is, is no mean, mean feat. And um, one of the sort of fables about Salt was that the, the director, the position that I now have, was also and changing light bulbs and fixing toilets and all kinds of things, um, which is like, <laughs> um, so you know, which is which is, uh, I think, shows a, a lot of commitment. But what's what's nice about now that we're part of the main College of Art is we have a whole you know facilities department who can handle that kind of thing. So Salt today is um, nestled in into the main College of Art. Although now um, the main College of Art is uh, the main College of Art and Design. Um, they changed we changed our name. Only a couple weeks ago. Um, so um, now uh, we've gone back to the sort of classic uh, heritage salt logo. Um, so that's sort of where we have, have come from in our approach to, to gathering these kind of stories from the community. Um, so what I want to talk about now is, um, oh, so sorry. 
We also have a, a story archive, um, which is having technical difficulties, so don't go there right now, but eventually you can go to the Salt Story Archive. It has everything from the last, um, Salt was founded in 1973, so we're coming on our 50th, 50th birthday. Um, so, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting about how Salt has, um, has evolved is, um, I, I love these old, old Salt um, pieces. And I think there's something so pure about the way the students went out and they like put a microphone in front of someone. A lot of times it was someone who was like related to them. Um, and uh, there's something really beautiful and pure about them. And like I said, like you could definitely make a lobster trap head after, after reading this. But um, what it isn't really um, is a story, exactly. You know, and a story is like something with tension or a rising action. It's like someone does something because of X, but Y. That's usually the, the kind of the formula that I teach my students when I'm teaching them storytelling. And there, there isn't really a story here, exactly. And I think, um, I don't know if it's because of kind of where we are right now as a culture or, um, or what, but I think like storytelling now is sort of the supreme way that people are sharing these types of stories. So I don't think it's quite as much like, uh, you don't see as much of this these days as you do, um, I think, storytelling. So um, you can kind of see these are um, a couple of recent, relatively recent, I guess not really that recent, but this is kind of like the last, um, uh, this is at the start of Salt doing some storytelling stuff. So, you know, rather than um, like how to knit something, this is uh, Dylan Volk in the spotlight, a teenage comic finds success on stage, off stage, it's a different story. So that's already, you can tell that's like, there's a story there, you're gonna learn something. Lost in translation, fleeing car bombs and death threats, 14 Iraqi entrepreneurs resettle in Maine, but life in America presents a new battle. Um, so I think, I don't think necessarily the mission, I think the mission of SALT stays the same. Like we are you know, getting these stories from the community, but I think what has changed is that um, there's a much more uh, storytelling approach to what we're doing now. Um, and I think in some ways that um, you can tie that back to the, um, the direction of audio to the SALT curriculum, because in audio, you just don't have as much time and you really, the, the stereotype about audio is that when you're listening to a radio story or a podcast, you're doing something else. You're washing the dishes, or you're driving your car, or you're in line for the bank, or something else. You're not just like, the days of just sitting around a radio are, are over. Um, so you, the, as a maker of, of audio, you really have to grab people's attention, and sort of the best way to do that is by creating a compelling narrative. So I think partially that has also changed the way that we approach how these stories are, or how this, yeah, how these stories are told. Um, so what I'm going to do now um, is I'm just going to play uh, an example of a, a somewhat recent um, salt piece, and this is takes place in. Uh, sorry, should I bring my phone? All right. Um, so this is in Lubeck, Maine. Does anyone know where Lubeck is? Back is about as far east as you can go and still be in the country. Um, so what happened was that um, about 10 years ago, um, people who back Maine uh, woke up uh, to find a very bad smell. And what had happened was a, a finback whale had, had washed up onto the beach. Um, so this is the story of what happened after that. So it's about six minutes, so I think I'm just try to settle in and, and go with the flow here. I know I said that the days of gathering around to listen are over, but we're going to go back there. Uh, right now for a few minutes. Tell me about the whale. Just tell me about the whale, please. I understand it's a fish story and all this stuff. It is a big fish. But what happened? You didn't go here and move back man. There was a whale that tangled up in the fisherman's line way off somewhere off of Quarter Hill. The whale could see them, see. And it drifted in the shore. It just couldn't swim. So the tide carried it in and it landed on the beach over here to go back. Not too far from here, see. But it's all right. I was down there. I couldn't tell you how long or 
the rail is roughly 55. 56 and a half feet long. Almost 70 foot animal. That's almost the size of an 18 foot truck. To me, it was huge. It was huge. It was huge. It laid down to be as high as this. It was the largest animal that I ever saw. No wonder in the whole of Bible, the children went into the belly of the whale. There was plenty of room there. That mountain was a big one. <coughs> laying there right on top of the big one. It was laying on the side. I remember it was blackish, grayish was color. Gray. It wasn't gray anymore. It wasn't grayish, blackish. It was mostly black, black and white. white. It was white, or whitish, grayish. There was a lot of moves on it by the sky. What it looked like was a big contaminant to me. It was a monster. I was frightened of the wood and dead. His mouth happened to be open. His mouth happened to be open. It didn't have a big foot. His mouth happened to be open. It might have been the uh, middle of August or something. Yeah, August. Yeah. That might have gotten it. Evidently, you walked up in the night and someone's body was after daylight laying around the feet. That was uh, early in the morning. The word had started to spread that this whale had washed the shore and people started coming in. I was down by myself. There were plenty of people around. On the first day we washed up, I went down. Yeah, look at the kids now who say it. Little kids were running up to it. Touching it. Climbing up on top of the whale, standing on it, and getting pictures taken. They knew it was coming. They knew it was coming. I think people in a small town handle death in a different way. They have to deal with it a lot more often. Everybody knows everybody, so when someone dies, the whole town grieves. I actually went down there, it was coming on to sunset, and I sat on the beach and smoked a cigarette and bawled my eyes out. Yeah, that's what I got. And I, I don't want back down. And we lived probably a thousand feet from the beach. The mystery of the whole thing is how we got there. Nobody knows if he died off in the bay and floated ashore, or was it grounded itself up and died on the beach, or was it just get confused? Nobody knows. Is it washed up on the beach? He got smiled up, could have been. I guess that's what that told me. Right? Get clear. You know, this is where it wanted to be. They called the coast guard to see if they could tow it back on the shore and let it go some other town. But they wouldn't do it. Because there had already been a couple other places, and that's what they'd done. They towed it out and went back on the round up. Well, there was no boat big enough. And depending upon the way the wind was blowing, the current was running. Something running the crossroads in the middle. And this thing laid on the beach for days while the town was trying to determine whether they how they were going to get rid of it. And it sat it was impossible but because the government didn't know what to do. They were arguing one branch of government, and they started arguing for two things to move. They couldn't move, they couldn't do anything. We're very poor town. Was the poorest county in the state of Maine, and that we'd be the ones who had to put the children. small town in back, it was big doing. <laughs> all the people in the town, in the town office, in the home nine yards, were all disturbed that the identity of their bodies began to smell them. They would speak the town. A lot of people were saying, We got more money here on the county over than this whale, see. You could smell it. What can I smell around here anyway? But this. Reef of death, rotten feet, set in the sun for a month. You could take the cover off the hands, but they hit it, man. That typically what you smell like. It was an oily, greasy smell. I'm afraid to know. Oh, it smelled like rotten feet. Rotten fish, oily. They hold us, they couldn't stand it. You know, when the wind was blowing, they couldn't stand it. Right on the town. Smell it from miles away. Far away, deep foot, man, they could smell it. Only touched it. Probably about the same as what it did, almost when it was alive, cold, the cold leaded. It did have a funny feel, texture of the animal. I touched it with one finger, and I used less oil because they had to get off the hand. They put hand cleaning in my hands, they put straight gasoline. Yeah, the one that bleaches it off the heat is messed by one that moves. And finally, they decided. Something had to be done about it. It would come to the point where well, no matter what it got, it had to go. They knew something had to be done, and they got it. And they did something. One thing led to another. So they called Rambo. Man named Rambo. That was notified by the town of that. The contact with the town did a hold of that. It was kind of a hazy, overcast day, and the sun didn't shine. 
I think they would like a crowd of 15 or 20 people after we showed up. There were a lot of people, maybe 100, 100 or so people. The word spread fast, everybody in town was there. And I just wondered where are they all going, you know? Why am I too? So we dug a hole as close as we could. And before I got the hole dug, he accidentally split it on his own. It's not graceful. I mean, it was so big, it just took its time. Just uh, the side gave it a little bit. He rolled in, he slept in, and rolled up, belly out. And they found it all in the hole. You know, but it's all quiet and down. Mm -hmm. They were kind of respectful. They were kind of sad to see it go. Oh, I don't know how to explain it. Something that you never think of dying. You always hear stories that are of whales that passed on fishing and soul. Maybe you think of them all out of Yeah. There's a lot of people who think, well, I'm so big, I'm so great. No matter how powerful they are, something will happen in life that will cause people to say, how small am I anyway? We're both mammals who have reached the pinnacle of, of our place, and uh, they, they just seem to be close to us. I feel close to them. And we buried it six feet over the top. I've got ground most of them covered up and all over. I've done great, you know, humans. They're in power also. It just seemed different to bury something with no box. <laughs> just put raw earth right back onto his body. You picture him as being immortal. Like a free soul, free will of them. You just don't see him dying. It was sad, it was very sad. And it took about two and a half hours, three hours to dig the hole, and then fill it back in. In my own time, we were all finished. I think I got like $300 to bury this thing. And then the town paid right through. Maybe the whale too, I don't know. It was just a day's work for me to, to go bury a whale. I mean, it was an oddity to bury a whale. something. Weird that it happened, and something unforeseen. If you never did see it, you wouldn't understand it. You know what I mean? Well, it was Saturday night, so they're still laying there. That's what all I can tell you. Well, every time I sense me, I'm going to have them take a stroll with us. That's the way things went. And uh, this is from our town, and we'll go back to Maine, just another fish story. <laughs> and. So to me, that's sort of like what salt does. You know, it's it's, it's the um, it's all these interviews with lots of community members giving this information, but then structured in a way that I think is, is compelling. And there's action, and there's reflection, and there's like funny music. Um, but also, I think it adds up to something in a way that um, I think all of salt's work does, and I think a lot of like more traditional oral history um, work. Does as well, but something, there's something about a story. Obviously, like we're you know, there's lots of writing about how humans are wired for story, and it's like a, such a compelling way for information to be passed on. So I think that's you know that's an example of that. Um, so just another thing I want to talk quickly about is um, uh, Salt has released its first ever narrative podcast. So if, if, for those of you who don't know, like podcasts are definitely having their moment, and especially serialized podcasts. There's a podcast called Serial which most people heard of Serial. Um, it's the one that sort of like launched the revolution of like, hey, like, you know, like multi-part podcast series is, is good. So uh, Salt, um, actually on, on Thursday, the third episode of this is going to release, and it's, um, it's called Sovereign, and it's about um, the tribes within Maine are um, different from any other tribe, uh, native tribes within Maine's borders, different from any other native tribe in the United States, and that they don't have full, full powers of sovereignty the way other uh, tribal nations do. And that's due to this like illegal treaty that they discovered in the 80s and they sued the state. And um, it's, it's a really wild story about who has the land and who has the power and, and why they're not sovereign. Um, so that's sort of another example of what I think I, an earlier iteration of Salt might have just been like a bunch of straight interviews with maybe you know, Wabanaki elders is now being you know, conceived and sold as, as like a narrative. Um, but you know, I also was thinking that there's, not everything has to be a narrative, and I think and sometimes like trying to fit something into a story is not always the best fit. So um, we've kind of come um, um, full circle in, in some ways recently. So we um, did um, 
we worked with the Portland Museum of Art to make um, a sort of audio, uh, enhanced audio guide for an upcoming, um, actually it's probably open now, uh, series of uh, exhibition of Walker Evans photographs. So this, um, each student picked a photograph and sort of did some research of it and created an audio piece in response to it. So some of them are very sort of like, here's the story behind this, but one of them is just um, kind of a, uh, sounds of, a, it's a, images of like a steel factory town. It's sort of images of steel being, like our, our sounds of steel being manufactured as you look at it. And another person got an actress to sort of embody um, the role of this Alabama cotton tent farmer wife. So it's, I think in some ways it's sort of breaking narrative and sort of creating an experience. And um, we also have um, sort of like uh, online classes that we started to offer, like, I think, like you all have. I think that's sort of common uh, thread from the um, from 2020, 2021. Um, but that's allowed us to sort of be more experimental. And um, you know, this is just, we have one right now called Beyond Story. And it's just like audio collages and essays and sort of getting abstract. So you know, I like to think that like, even though we've evolved to um, be an organization that is very much focused on telling stories and putting things into story form, that's not the only way to do documentary work and that's not the only way to convey information. So I think what we're trying to do now is um, think about like, what's, what's beyond that, like what's after story, what else can we do, like some non-linear or inventive ways of, of telling stories and that's what this collaboration with the Portland Museum of Art was about and that's sort of what we're trying to do with some of our more esoteric unusual uh, online classes. Um, so, um, oh, so that's me. Um, I think the only other thing I was want to sort of mention is that um, kind of bringing it back to Foxfire is um, it was a, a constructivist um, sort of approach, and I'm not like a super um, constructivist. Someone's like super familiar with that concept, but basically what it is, it's an educational theory or practice where students kind of make their own meaning as they are, um, as they're learning. So you, they sort of produce something and they bring their own meaning to it and they kind of create their own meaning as they're making it and sort of in, like inquiring what they're actually doing. And I think that is sort of what has uh, been the through line with, with Salt um, all along. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me down to speak and I'm happy to answer any questions or um, have a conversation or anything else. So thanks. I'm the director of SALT, um, so I, um, I'm also a graduate of SALT, I went there in 2008. Um, so my role, I actually teach one class there, which meets once a week, which is called the SALT Workshop, which is sort of like an investigation of various documentary forms. Um, and then um, I also do all the hiring of the instructors and um, that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't change light bulbs. No, I do, I sweep out the classroom now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, how far in the world has your, your work spread? I mean, yeah. are there people that you hear from unexpectedly from another continent? Mm -hmm. What does that happen? Yeah, so um, the SALT um, diaspora is, is really pretty remarkable. Um, I think especially in, in my public media, you know, you can't scrape the surface too much before you find someone who went to SALT. Like, um, this American Life, Radio Lab, StoryCorps, um, New York Times, New Yorker, like, like any, like they're kind of everywhere. And there's you know some promotional material we have that's like salt students go on to be here, 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 and here. So it's it's a really, um, uh, I think the people who are drawn to salt are really ready to like fully launch themselves into something new. And I think that creates like a really passionate. Um, yeah, but salt salt is everywhere. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Do you still do internships or the actual? No, oh, the like the, uh, the boat building and such? No, we don't do those anymore. It's, it's just, uh, right now we're offering um, classes in radio and podcasting and, and short film are the two sort of main tracks that we're doing. So um, we just found over the years that um, we weren't getting applicants for writing uh, anymore. And I don't know 
if that's because there's a kind of a rise in like more MFA programs for writing, or if it's more about like a shift from you know from print to to digital forms like audio and short film or what. And then same with photography, it just seems like um, there wasn't as viable a career path right now for photographers. We weren't getting as many applicants in photography, so we started offering classes in, in short film. John? Yeah, Isaac, um, do you have like a starter kit for communities so they could like um, bring the inspiration of salt? And you know, if you did, what would be the couple of first two things you would recommend? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, for me, we don't necessarily offer like a, a sorry, there's like a thing that just flew in. I thought it was a bat, but I think it was just like a little uh, leaf or something. Um, so um, we don't offer right now like a salt day for organizations. This is something that I would, I would like to start doing. But, but for us, it really just starts with, um, with the interview, with, with sitting down with someone. I think that's probably the most powerful way to start any sort of, of project. And um, I, I don't know if it was in the bio that I gave you, but I used to work at, at StoryCorps as well. It's this sort of national oral history nonprofit radio program. And um, they have a list of, of great questions on their website. Um, and they are really amazing, like open-ended questions. And they're actually like broken into like great questions about work, great questions about growing up, great questions about you know being in a family. Um, so it's like, a, um, is there a critter back there? Yeah. <laughs> what is it? A praying, praying mantis? Praying mantis? Yeah. There's a story. Wow. <laughs> yeah, really. We had bats in our house for like a year and it was really some traumatized. Um, so, anyway, yeah, I would say like um, uh, the, the best thing you could do, I think, would be just to start a conversation and um, like encourage people to, to interview each other. I think that's sort of a, a great, um, and you know, you can record with your, with your smartphones these days and get like pretty decent audio. So I think I wouldn't let like a technological barrier stop you from just trying to, to start something. Yeah. Do you have any relationship, Maine, Maine has lots of museums and bookstores the main publishers and authors and writers groups, and I was wondering, Maine is such a huge state going north yeah. that to, to find some of these people, other than maybe the people you know through your own network, but I just wondered what kind of network do you have throughout the state and maybe museums and, and historic house museums also could help find some of these people for your story, the documentary. Yeah, no, that, that's a great idea, and I think um, that's one of the things that I would like to do a better job of is really like expanding our network beyond the greater Portland area. Um, but you know, there's um, 50 years worth of, of salt stories, and salt has pretty much you know been over the, the whole state. And a lot of times, um, I'm amazed by how students find the stories that they do, and we'll, we'll give them sort of tips on like research and like what. You know how to find a character, how to approach somebody, but I would like to do sort of more targeted like partnerships with, with organizations like we did with the Portland Museum here, um, and I think it's something that Salt used to do more, more of. Um, and actually, we are working with this one organization called um, the Third Coast, which is like an oral history, a traveling oral history project that kind of goes up the coast of Maine, and um, uh, it's run by this woman Galen Coke, and she uh, is also works a lot with like. Um, archives, like oral history archives, and teaches how to turn those into stories. So like how do you take sort of like a 60 minute interview with someone about meeting a lobster head trap, and then you sort of make a narrative within that. Um, so she actually has encountered a bunch of interviews that were done for Saul in the 70s about Eastport, Maine, which is like another very far east town. Um, so we're gonna build a class around um, Kind of turning those into like stories and then exhibit them on her her website. But I think that's something that we should. I would like to do more of, like, because Maine is huge, and like, I don't know anyone in you know Presque Isle, Maine, which is <laughs> way, 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 way up there. Um, but for for Sovereign, the podcast that we're doing about the um, tribes of Maine, we, we did work with the Penobscot Nation tribal ambassador to to tell that story. So that's a relationship that I'm hoping to to deepen for sure.
How would we find that podcast? It's available wherever you get your podcasts. Um, so, uh, you know, um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, those kinds of things. If you search for Sovereign or, or the Salt Institute, it'll be there. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about the special... Yeah. I was fascinated by a couple of things. One is that those reflections change so much over the years. And so there'll be like you know, 15 or 20 year lapse between the initial reporting and what people have to say more recently. And the other thing was that you might think, and I've been involved in some production, you might think that it would take a lot of production skill and so on. And it might. I, I don't know if you saw it in the actual. But the raw material simply was that they set up a booth, which was a private booth, and anybody that had a story to tell mm -hmm. could simply go in and nobody even turned on the camera. The person who was speaking turned on the camera and turned off the camera. And some of the reflections were just spectacular because they may have been comments that the person wouldn't have even felt comfortable giving to one other person that they might not have even known. But to do that reflection, it was just inspiration to listen to what happened, the people who held together, and most especially what difference it made in their lives. So, I mean, the story of the whale is really a great story. Yeah. And I'm sure there are a million stories that we know about right here in town. So, it'd be great to be able to get involved in doing this. Yeah, totally. And I think, um, you know, uh, <laughs> People really, it's, it's really rare that we just sit and listen to, to someone else. And I think it's, it's very powerful on both sides. It's very powerful to, to do that, to like just sit and listen to someone. But then as someone who has been asked to share your story, your life experience, it's also very powerful. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's flattering. <laughs> like, every, like a lot of people, you know, um, are, are very flattered by it. But it's also, I think, uh, I like, it can be a very powerful experience just just listening uh, to people and just just telling your story. Have South ever offered any classes or stories about the music of Maine? I mean, the mouth harp was, was <laughs> wonderful in the, in the six minutes of that story. Yeah, um, there definitely are you know stories about music uh, in the in the archives. Um, I I don't know off the top of my head like what what all they did. There's certainly ones about, you know, sea shanties and, and those kinds of things. And um, a recent student um, found a Portland bus driver uh, who was also writing an original rock opera and <laughs> interviewed him about that. Um, and, and some of the music was featured in the piece. So. Are we one more or are we done? Uh, one more question for okay. Isaac. Do you I want to just wanted to know if high school students are still involved. Sounds like you've maybe moved to Older students? Older yeah, um, so there's this great organization in Maine called um, Blunt Youth Radio, which works with high school students. So right now we're kind of working on trying to do something with them and the um, Portland Public Library to kind of go back to doing something for high school students. So there hasn't been for, there has not been for a while, but it's something that we would like to um, uh, resurrect. Yeah. Isaac, thank you very much. Thank you.